Well, hello, everybody uh, there in Germany. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, uh, I hope you're having a good conference and a good afternoon. I'm just making you big on my screen. That's the wrong button. Oops. Oh, there we go. Okay, now you're on full screen video on my screen. Uh, what I plan to do today, and, and you'll get a taste of my uh, very low tech create a presentation out of pieces that are lying around your living room kind of presentation. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. So here's, uh, here's what I have planned for today. And I, I hope this is close enough for you to read. If not, well, it's the best I could do with the tech that I had. Uh, basically, I want to give an overview of the connectivism course that I'll be offering. Uh, if I could ask whoever's on the other end, as I'm speaking, to mute your sound, so that, that'll just prevent a little bit of the echo that's coming there. Um, then I, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, my routine in the course. Ah, excellent. That's much better. Thank you. Um, basically uh, what what I had planned and the setup that I had to do for the course and then uh, what's actually happening. We're talking a bit about what we've covered in the course, the actual content of the course thus far. And I'm going to talk about Grasshopper, the application that I'm using for my part of the course. And then I'll do a little bit of wrap up. I would like to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. So I'm going to zip through this reasonably quickly. Although if uh, you find that I'm going too fast or there's something that you would uh, like me to elaborate on, by all means, stop me. I'll be happy to address questions and comments during the flow. Of course, if you do that, turn off the mute on your microphones on your end. The, uh, so to begin the overview of the course, uh, for me, it was, it was kind of a unique opportunity, and George Siemens gave me a call, and he proposed it to me, that we combine two things that we've both been talking about for a while. On the one hand, the idea of connectivism, which is to say a distributed form of learning, and especially learning online, and on the other hand, open educational resources. And so what the proposition was, was that the University of Manitoba would deliver an online course for credit uh, uh, toward the uh, certificate in adult and continuing education. And at the same time, we would open up the course to anybody on the internet who wanted to do that. We've had some precedent for that already. David Wiley, the previous year, had offered an, an open course via a wiki um, on open educational resources, and Alec Koros in Saskatchewan had recently offered an open course. So George and I decided we would do pretty much the same sort of thing. Uh, we posted it on our on our um, respective mailing lists, and we got something like, well, to begin with, we got about 1,800 people signed up right away, and we're up to about 2,200 people now. So that right away created some logistical problems for us. But nonetheless, what our plan was, was again to create a course online that would follow the principles of connectivism. So you might wonder how a course on the principles of connectivism is designed. I'm going to give you a resource here where I will be pointing. So first of all, I'm going to go into connect.downs.ca, and you can see that there. Uh, and you can note that down for later if uh, you don't have your computer with you right now. I'm going to pop into pop into the uh, the course itself and go to a page called Places. There it is. And here's what the design of the course looks like. And on this screen, particularly on your screen, it's probably not going to be very simple and straightforward. But what I want to emphasize to you that is that this is not your typical linear course structure where everybody is being marched through lessons and, and assignments and all of that in lockstep. And also, equally importantly, it's not your centralized course structure where everybody uses the same resource. Uh, in order to do learning, for example, a learning management system or something uh, of of that nature. So right off the bat, what we did is we set up a number of different entities. First of all, 
we set up a course blog. And here's the course blog. Again, we're, we're in the middle of the course here. And so consequently, you're seeing regular blog posts. Secondly, we set up a Moodle forum. And so I'm looking to the Moodle forum now. It's uh, going to be a wee bit slow on us here. So here is the Moodle forum. We've set up individual discussions for each week. Uh, so we're, we're five weeks into the course now. Third, we set up a course mailing list. This course mailing list is just being run using ListServ software out of the University of Manitoba. Oh, no, I'm sorry, my mistake. But George has set up a mailing list using ListServe, but we also have a mailing list using Google Groups, a Connectivism and Connective Knowledge mailing list. And as well, we have set up a PageFlakes site. What this PageFlakes site is intended to do is to aggregate resources from around the internet that relate to the connectivism course. And what we have done is to ask people to tag any materials related to the course with CCK08. And PageFlight seems to be in trouble right now, so I'm going to back out of that. It's repeating the top tabs numerous times. Wow, isn't that interesting? I've never seen page flights do that. <laughs> uh, this is one of the things we've discovered through the course of this course is that uh, a lot of these technologies aren't necessarily reliable. Uh, on Wednesdays, we've been using Illuminate, and we've been having regular weekly discussions in Illuminate. We're linking to these discussions through the course wiki, and so for week one, for example, we jump to week one here in the wiki, and we have the link to the Illuminate, um, to the Illuminate discussion. Then um, on Fridays, we've been using Ustream. Ustream, of course, is uh, a system that allows you to produce video casts. We've been using it for audio casts only, and we've had the help of Dave Cormier at Ed Tech Talk. Uh, and what they've been doing is they've been recording our conversations on Skype, and then as we have this conversation, they've been broadcasting that live through Ustream. Usually, uh, EdTech Talk uses a Shoutcast server, but we've been using the Ustream server in this instance just to make uh, the, the content more accessible to people. Although, yesterday, uh, which was our regular Friday Ustream discussion, we had another case of one of these free applications fell apart in mid-session, uh, mid and we had to jump away from that and back into the Illuminate discussion. As well, we've set up a course Twitter profile, CCK08, and so we have people following occasional announcers on the CCK08 Twitter profile. We had Terry Anderson in this, uh, in, uh, guesting this week, and consequently, uh, we've been doing things like announcing Terry Anderson guesting using the Twitter profile. So that was basically the, the overview, the way we set up the course material. And what we've, uh, what we've discovered is that we also allowed people to create their own resources. In fact, we didn't simply allow people to create their own resources. We actually encouraged people to create their own resources. And so we saw an awful lot of additional things being set up by students for themselves in order to support their participation in the course. And just as a, a couple of quick examples here, um, uh, someone set up a Twitter post via Tweens, uh, and they've been uh, aggregating Twitter posts, any Twitter post that has to do with CCK08 and not just the Twitter profile. As well, the students set up the Twitter, uh, sorry, the Flickr CCK08 images, and so many of the images that are associated with the course, most of these produced by students, uh, have been stored or on Flickr and are accessible via this tag. As well, 
the, uh, the students set up a connectivism twine page and they've been using the, uh, the twine page to aggregate resources and, and uh, basically communicate among themselves in this sort of offshoot type of group. Over and above that, they've set up a connectivism Facebook group. I haven't looked at the Facebook group recently, so I'm not sure what activity there has been on it, but there is, and, and there's currently 394 members of the connectivism Facebook group. And this is something that we've noticed. Uh, what's happening is there is no thing that is, is taking up 2,200 people, uh, everybody in the course. What has happened is people have split off. There's, you know, like 400 in the Facebook group, a uh, couple hundred in the Twine, a bunch more following the Twitter. E the course is sort of breaking up into subgroups. Here's a, uh, a group, uh, Connectivism Community in Chilbo, which is a second life group and they've set up an entire connectivism village and they've been having regular sessions in that connectivism village. I haven't had a chance to visit them in the connectivism village, but George has been in there once and I plan to go in in week eight or week nine, somewhere down there. There's a LinkedIn group and Oh, I have to sign into LinkedIn, the silly thing. Uh, there's, so there's a LinkedIn group, and again, it's a, very similar to the Facebook group where people are uh, exchanging uh, links, resources, conversation, and the like. It's going to take me a few seconds to back out of that. There's a, a DJO group. DJO allows people not simply to discuss resources, but also to annotate the resources. So this group has been set up, and it's not a large group, um, but uh, nonetheless, it's an interesting way of, of looking at these things. I'm just trying to see how many people are members of this group, but it doesn't seem to display that right on the front cover. Oh yeah, there it is, nine. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Hey, in, a, in a course of 2,200 people, here you have this thing this this little community with nine people and so they have their own very sort of quiet discussion off to one side as the course continues. Uh, another group set up a connectivism online Ning called Connecting Online and uh, so this one has quite a few more members as you can see here there's all the pictures of all the members or some of the members I, I'm not sure how many there are all together but dozens and dozens of them, obviously. And again, their, their, their conversations are taking place in their environment. Finally, the uh, students who are taking the course for credit at the University of Manitoba toward that certificate uh, in adult and continuing education were, were feeling a bit marginalized and they set up their own Yahoo group and, and here it is and they also by themselves organized their own Sunday meetings using X meeting. I think it was X meeting. Um, and so they've been uh, managing their own collaboration all the way through. Now one of the really important things that I found about this course uh, from, from student feedbacks is one of the major things that we've set up which is a daily newsletter. Uh, we call the daily newsletter The Daily and that's because I really have no imagination. And this newsletter goes out every day. This newsletter uh, basically provides some announcements such as uh, if we've posted some audio such as the audio from the discussion that took place um, any highlighted resources and George and I look through the, the various blogs and other resources that have been produced by students and highlight some and then it aggregates the, the uh, RSS feeds from various members who are in the course and all of this is run using uh, the software that I created called Grasshopper which I'll talk about in a little bit. Now, it, it, what's one of the things that I found interesting is that the way the course came out wasn't exactly the way we had planned it. When we planned it originally, we sat down, we thought, okay, we'll have some sort of presentation on Mondays. 
uh, audio or video or something like that. Then we'll have an Illuminate discussion on Wednesday, and then we'll have the uh, Ustream discussion on Friday. So three hours a week, no real big problem. Well, right off the bat, I found that I had to do some coding in order to adapt Grasshopper, which is the software that I use on my website to run my own newsletter. I needed to adapt that to this course because it was never designed to be teaching software. It was designed to be more of a personal learning environment kind of software. So I spent time doing that, and right off the bat I found myself falling behind. The other thing I discovered is that, and I must have seen this coming, the volume of communications in this post, or sorry, in this course was extreme, particularly in the Moodle forum. And it wasn't until week three that I simply started taking large numbers of the posts in the Moodle forum and put them, putting them in a separate directory in my email and forgetting about them. One of the things that we found ourselves telling students after the end of week one, and we had to remind ourselves of the same thing, is that you can't expect to cover all of the content in this course, and indeed, that is not the intent. Uh, the, one of the ideas of connectivist knowledge is that there is too much knowledge in the world for any given person to, uh, to comprehend, and knowledge is instead created by people having a, a, their own individual perspective, their own individual point of view on the state of affairs in the world. And that reflects itself in this course, where each person taking a part of the course has their own perspective on the materials in this course, their own point of view. So some of them may see some Flickr posts, others may see a few of the Moodle posts, others may look at some blogs and the rest, but nobody sees everything. And, no, and that's because nobody can see everything. But each person sees what they see, and then they offer reflections on that and contribute that reflection, and it's through the totality of those reflections that the knowledge produced by this course is produced. So, I sort of fell into a practice that was a bit different than I intended. Um, but but now, by now, it's week five. I've fallen into a bit of a routine. For one thing, um, I'm doing more online sessions than originally planned. We had originally planned one Illuminate session on Wednesday, but one of the things about this course is we had a global enrollment, and our uh, 1 p.m. session, 1 p.m. my time, which would be uh, about 5 p.m. your time, uh, turns out to be in the middle of the night in Australia and in Japan and in Malaysia. So as soon as we scheduled that, we heard about it from those people. So we've scheduled two Illuminate sessions on Wednesday, one, in, one at midday for us and one in the evening for us. Um, the other thing is, although it doesn't take a lot of time, producing the daily newsletter takes a bit more time than I had planned mostly because I felt it relevant to highlight materials. Let, let me just pop you into this here. And I, and I, I really do hope the screen shows up sort of well. Um, now, where I'm going here now is I'm going into the software that actually runs the daily itself. So this is the administration screen behind the scenes at the daily. Now. One of the things that the uh, software, uh, Grasshopper software is, it's not simply blogging software, but it's also an RSS aggregator. So what we ask the students to do is to give us all of their RSS feeds. So if they created a blog somewhere, we ask them to give us the address of that blog. So here, as you can see, and there's, there's like dozens and dozens and dozens of them, are the blogs that have been submitted by the students. And I'm not sure how many there are right now. There's about 120 or 100. Oh, <laughs> there's 174. Um, but some, not all of them are active. There's about 150 of them are active. So 
people are, are creating posts in these blogs. Now, I'm not even aggregating the Moodle forums. I thought about aggregating the Moodle forums when I first started, but I realized I'd probably be getting too much stuff if I was aggregating the Moodle forums. So all I'm aggregating is the blog posts. I'm also not aggregating the Facebook. I'm not aggregating the Twine and the other resources. In a future, perhaps smaller iteration of this course, I would like to aggregate these resources as well as the student blogs. So the aggregator is set up. It, it aggregates each one of these posts. It, it just runs through, uh, uh, aggregates one link every minute so I don't overload my server. And then I have a page defined, which is basically the, the the daily newsletter itself and so I'm going to list the pages that I have on the site and here is the the page for the daily now this defines the daily and what this does here what this code does here is it tells the grasshopper system to get information from the database and to display it and I also have a page which is a recent blog posts page and this is a page that does nothing but aggregate the blog posts that were created by the students. So what I do when I'm getting ready to do the daily in the morning, that's what I do, uh, I do it first thing in the morning, is I view the generated version of this page. So this is the most recent version of the page that aggregates all of the student blog posts. So this is what the students have produced up to the minute, well, more accurately, up to the hour, which is close enough. And so I take a look at what they've done, and then I decide, oh, yes, I'll include this. I won't include that. Um, I, I get a chance to read everything in one location, which for me is very handy. And then if I find something I like, then I'll create a post of that item. So here's the screen for creating the post, and I'll just put the information and I'll type a description in, and then that produces the daily. So we'll go to the daily page. This is the newsletter that gets sent out every day. So here we have an announcement at the start. This is Fridays because uh, we publish it Monday through Friday. So Friday we have an announcement announcing our Ustream discussion. Uh, that we did in fact have. On Monday we'll have an announcement talking about the recording of the Ustream dis discussion. Then these are the highlighted resources. These are the posts that I create. And then these are the blog posts that students created in the preceding 24 hours. Now it's really slowed down. Uh, if we go back, we'll look at the daily archives. So here are the daily archives. If we go back, say, to week two, and look at the daily. Oh, look at the blog posts that people are writing in week two. There's just a list, a huge long list of them. Now we're down to about five or ten a day. Here's, here's from Thursday. Um, there's a, a video embedded into the newsletter. Uh, so here Thursday we had about a dozen. Friday we had five. And so we're, we're now moving down into a more manageable pace. The course so far, like I say, there's been there's been uh, five weeks to the course so far, and the course is titled Connectivism and Connective Knowledge, and the course is about the method that we're using to deliver the course. So it's a, it's kind of recursive, <coughs> excuse me, in that way. And what we've been trying to do is to illustrate connectivism at the same time we've been talking about it. So in the first week we define what connectivism is and what connectivism is is the idea that knowledge is distributed across a web of connections. To know something is to be organized, to have a set of connections in a particular way and therefore to learn is to develop or to grow that organization, that network of connections. So for the second week, we talked quite a bit about what that means, uh, what, what is connective knowledge exactly. And for my own part, for that week, I was interested in the discussion of propositional versus non-propositional knowledge, the idea that 
knowledge on the old theory, uh, the old way of looking at learning, is propositional. It's, uh, it comes in the form of sentences, where the sentences have meaning and, have, uh, and may refer to events in the world. On my view, knowledge as, as non-propositional is taken up in this network of connections. This network of connections literally is the knowledge itself. The third week, we talked about properties of networks, and we had Valdis Krebs in. One of the things with a group this large is it becomes a lot easier to get guest speakers to come in, and the guest speakers have been very popular so far. So Valdis Krebs came in. He's got 20 years or so of network analysis uh, background. He walked us through the theory of networks, particularly with respect to social network analysis. He talked about the methodology of social network analysis. and more importantly, he talked about different types of networks. The week following, we talked about the history of networks and especially the foundations for connectivism, the foundations in social network theory, the foundations in mathematics and in graph theory, the foundations in the computer science theory of connectionism, and the foundations in neuroscience. And then finally, this week, we've, talking, we've been talking about a distinction that has been drawn between groups and networks. And this is something that is largely derived from my own writing. But the idea of the distinction between groups and networks is that uh, we can talk about ways networks can work better or worse. And so in any collection of people, there's a range um, uh, of, of possible states, of possible ways of being organized. And on the one end of that range is what I call the group. And on the other end of that range is what I call the network. And the distinction between the group and the network is found through four different uh, variables. First of all, the degree of diversity in the membership of the network and the degree to which that diversity is encouraged, the degree of autonomy that each of the members have in determining not simply their own actions, but also their own objectives, their own goals, their own beliefs, and their own values. Third, the degree of openness. Uh, openness in networks or uh, looking at it from the point of view of groups, the, the barriers or the walls, or, the, or even if they're not actual physical barriers or physical walls, the idea of there being a very distinct group identity, a, a very distinct sense of belonging or not belonging to the group. And then fourth, the way knowledge is created in this collection of people, whether it is created by taking the knowledge of one person and propagating it to others so all of the members have the same knowledge, and that's a group type of, of knowledge formation, as opposed to knowledge which is emergent from the interaction of the members of the groups where no individual member of the group has the knowledge that is contained in the group as a whole. So those four principles distinguish the uh, what I call groups from what I call networks. And the idea is that a network ought to promote diversity, it ought to promote autonomy, it ought to promote openness, and it ought to promote emergent knowledge. And so those four criteria, in turn, become principles for the creation of the structure of the course that we've created. And they also become the principle for the selection of technology that we use in order to run the course. Now, some people have commented, and they're completely right, that we're not completely network-oriented, that members aren't completely autonomous, um, that there is a complete diversity of you know, I've had the comment that you're not completely diverse if you're not speaking Finnish. And I suppose that's true, but there are some practical limits that uh, on the diversity that we are able to bring into the course, although I think that we've managed overall to have a very diverse course, both in terms of the membership in the course, but also in terms of the technology that we've used. Autonomy. 
uh, although we have a structure, a week-by-week -week structure, people are very autonomous both in the sense of whether or not they follow that structure, whether or not they read the readings, uh, whether or not they even actually attend any of the parts of the course and just do their own thing using their own technology. Openness was very important to us. Uh, one of the things George said as we were starting up the course is that um, what MIT Open Courseware did for open content, we are doing with this course for course delivery. And there's, there's three major elements of openness, open content, open delivery, and then the third, which will evolve probably in the year to come, in the years to come, open assessment. So we are in the second stage of this progression. We've gone from open content to open delivery. So that's the course as a whole. I'm going to very briefly take you to the Grasshopper site. There's not a whole lot to see here, but I, I would like to have you at least see it because it has a neat logo. So the Grasshopper, Grasshopper is the software that I use to aggregate the course material, the, uh, the course blogs and anything else. It's also the software that I use to manage the list of feeds. It's also the software that I use to create course pages and other course resources and, of course, to create and distribute the daily newsletter. Uh, Grasshopper is an open source application. It's written in Perl. And as you can see, you can download it. Uh, it's licensed under uh, GPL, and it's created by, well, me, uh, but under the auspices of the National Research Council of Canada. That's, there's a lot more I could talk about, both this course and the software that's uh, used to create it. But I think that's a, a good overview of where we've been so far. So I think I'll stop with the formal presentation type presentation at this point in time and see if there are any comments or questions that you'd like to address in the time that remains. Okay. Uh, the question is, does it all make sense to students? And I think that's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, with, with 2,200 students, there isn't a single general answer, but by and large, not at first. Um, at first, it's, it's kind of a big mess. And especially in the first week, we had a lot of students struggling to find their place, uh, to find their, their rooting in the course. Now people, you know, now that we're in week five, we've talked about the concept a bit, and we've also demonstrated the concept now for five weeks, people are beginning to settle in, and we're not seeing the messages that we were seeing in the first weeks uh, along the lines of, it's too much, I don't know what to do, I can't handle it. And these people now have found a place, they found a niche within the course, and to a large degree, they've accepted what we've told them, that the way to learn from this course is not to try to comprehend everything, but to comprehend what you can from your perspective. So, you know, the, these, the question is, do people understand? And collectively, they probably do. As, as an entire class, they probably do. Individually, I think it's still coming in bits and pieces. Well, not entirely. I mean, with Grasshopper, there, there is a section where I pick what I think is important, but there's also a section which just simply aggregates everything that the students have produced. Um, also, too, I have the list of feeds, and I have made the OPML 
of that list of feeds available to the students, and we have encouraged students, those that want to, to load the OPML in Google Reader or some other RSS reader of their own, and to uh, read the uh, blogs that way. So there's no sense in which there's, there's this bottleneck through which all the course material must come. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I missed the last part. So, what is the video of now? Because, okay, in between, there was the internet. Right. Yeah, we, we we had we had a lot of that sort of comment in the first week, and of course that was exactly the wrong time to have that sort of comment because it was before we presented any elements of the theory. Uh, but the, the short version that I would give is that uh, what we bring is that that McLuhan did not necessarily is a story about how these connections get formed in the network. And uh, in some of the readings that we've presented to the students, for example, uh, I've outlined the, the principles of associationism that create connections in a network. And the, these principles are, are, are well known. They're not original to us either, but uh, you know, there's Hebbian association, association by proximity, back propagation, which is straight from the connectionist theory of computer science, and Boltzmann mechanisms, which is another principle of association. Associationism, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, is a theory that goes back as far as David Hume, and indeed even earlier, it has its origins in British empiricism. Um, but associationism as a mechanism for connection formation in a knowing network, I think that that is new. Uh, I think there are, there are other aspects are, that are new. I don't, I'm not going to be able to, to itemize all of those uh, in this short time that we have. But I, I think that we do have a bit of a different perspective than McLuhan did. But that said, I mean, uh, both George and I are influenced by McLuhan. There, there's no question about it. There, there are elements of McLuhan in our thinking. Open content is the idea of making educational resources available to people. It was pioneered by MIT OpenCourseWare, although they were not the first necessarily to do that. But the idea here is that you take the materials that would be used in an educational environment, the, the course outline, the curriculum, the readings, demonstrations, videos, and whatever, and you place these on the web and allow open access under a license typically that allows for reuse. Uh, OpenCourseWare uh, licenses their material under Creative Commons that allows for non-commercial reuse of their materials by anyone in the world. Open content can also mean open course packages, such as uh, the British Open University provides, where they're providing not just the materials, but they're actually providing entire online courses. But MIT has always said that uh, open courseware is not the equivalent of an MIT education. An MIT education consists also of the support, the tutoring, the instruction being provided by the professors, as well as the communications and collaboration among the students. And so that leads us to the second component of open learning, which is what we've called open delivery. And open delivery means simply that uh, the activities of the instructors or the professors are also available in an open format. And so, consequently, all of George's and my uh, online sessions are open to anyone who wants to join them. And as well, the communications among the students are open. And open not just in the sense that anybody can listen to them or watch them, but in the sense that anybody can partake in them, that anybody can set up their own version of the communications. 
then finally that leads to the least defined of the open elements in open courses, which is open assessment. Uh, open assessment is a bit of a tricky question because there are different ways that, that, we're, that it could roll out. Uh, it could be the idea that assessment is conducted by a community, such as we see in recommender networks. So the idea here would be a, a person who wanted to be assessed would place a resource available uh, for assessment in a public forum, and the community would perform that assessment. That's one way of looking at it. Another model that has emerged in our course is where the delivery is open, and uh, we make the assessment instruments and the assessment criteria available, so in other words, the tests and the marking schemes. We apply those locally at the University of Manitoba course, but also another student in another institution completes those assessment requirements and are graded by their instructors or their professors in their own institutions. And so uh, anybody can conduct an assessment uh, based on uh, access to the materials and, and, and the uh, processes in the course. So that's, a, that's another model of open assessment that becomes a possibility. Um, we don't have a more concrete understanding of open assessment because we haven't actually attempted open assessment in this course, although we have the first sort of instances of it beginning to happen. Uh, anything showing up with regard to students from different countries doing what? I'm sorry. Ah, I understand. We uh, don't have statistics mapping uh, country of origin to tool use, so I can't answer that question concretely. I can say that there has been some clustering. Uh, according to national origin. For example, the Spanish students have set up their own uh, network called the Conectivitas, and so they are using a social networking tool there. But other than that, I can't say I've observed anything in particular. Did you ask whether it can be done in other subjects? Yes. Yes, I do. Um, one of the things I would like to do, and uh, this may be an experiment for the future, is to try this open delivery in a subject that is not related to education at all. Now, I have a, a background in a history in teaching philosophy, and in particular teaching critical thinking. So one of the things I would like to do, and I just want to find some sort of university to associate with this, uh, is to offer a critical thinking course. And because uh, I taught critical thinking for seven years with Athabasca University, so I know what that's like doing it the regular way, doing it in class and doing it by distance. And it would be very interesting to experience what that feels like doing it in an open way. I expect fewer people would join that course, though. Uh, okay, it's, I, I treat it as a flow, as a stream, it's something constant, it's something background. Um, I do have some tricks that I use, but, but one of the main thing is 
I don't expect, nor do I plan to see everything. It's just not possible. Um, <laughs> we, we had hundreds and hundreds of messages in the Moodle forum. Now, over the years, I've learned to read web stuff pretty quickly, so I was able to cover quite a bit just by skim reading. But, but seriously, the, the first thing is I don't expect to cover everything. The second thing is I don't fall behind. Um, or if I do fall behind, anything that I've missed is lost. It's gone. Um, I don't let myself get backed up. Everything is a new day. Everything starts on a new day. At the beginning of the day, there are zero messages. There are zero posts. That's very important because it allows me to settle into a routine. And the routine is, um, yeah, you know, I, I have my email. I was going to show you this earlier, but I forgot. But I'll show it now. I have my email, and in my email, I have the posts that come in from the discussion. I have my Google Alerts. So here's a Google Alert for e-learning. Here's the Google Alert for CCK08 specifically. I have my Twine Digest comes in, um, you know, and, and so on. So I've set up, and I've, I've learned to do this over the years, I've set up my input streams. And then email is important because for me because it creates these input streams. And the Google Alerts, the, the Moodle things, the Dejo Digest, uh, individual communications, and I just deal with them as they come in. It comes in, deal with it, done. Comes in, deal with it, done. Uh, I don't let it linger. I don't let it back up because, again, if it does back up, it's gone. It's lost. Um, and, and I don't lose sleep over it. You, you can't cover everything. The other thing is the, the grasshopper very much does do a lot of the work for me. I have zero formatting that I have to do. Uh, it, it produces all my HTML code. Um, I don't need to take care of the mailing list. It takes care of the mailing list for me. And I even have, and, and I'll show it very quickly here. Now, again, Grasshopper works with my email. And uh, where is it here? It seems to me, oh, I hope I didn't delete it. Uh, Oh, I think I did delete it. Oh, well, never mind. Um, when when people make a new post or when, when people sign up or register for the site, I get an email. Um, I have spam filters, but this allows me to, to delete the spam instantly. So I don't need to, you know, if I get a spam registration, bang, it's gone. So I don't need to do anything other than hit a button. If I get a spam input, I hit a button, that's it, it's gone. So that saves me a lot of time as well. And then the grasshopper doing the aggregating, like I say, it's, it's running on a server. Once every minute, it aggregates another feed. That saves me so much time. I don't go looking for things at all. I've set up all of my systems so that the information comes to me, and then I just treat it like a river and, and drink of it what I can and let the rest go on to someone else. I think really that's the only way to do it. Any more questions from the audience? Maybe one last one for me. Um, don't your colleagues think you're crazy? Because <laughs> they like what you do, I, I really do, and I've tried some of the stuff you're doing on myself. But I always had a hard time um, convincing or like even defending myself. But because the university, the, the, the whole education system is built on a completely different basis, and you're flipping it upside down, which is a very healthy approach, I think. But, you know, there might be some trouble. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. I mean, my academic career has been an interesting one, to say the least. Um, uh, I'm lucky to have found a home in the National Research Council of Canada. It might be the only place where I could possibly get away with this in the world. Uh, because here at the National Research Council, I'm able to define my own work, my own research program. Uh, uh, we sit down every year. We, we conduct what's called a PPR. And basically what that is is me negotiating with my managers what my job will be. And so when I say to them, I want to pursue learning networks, this gets covered under the heading of what they call foundational research. And, and that, that allows me to pursue this however I, I see fit. Now, 
it runs into a bit of conflict because they like to see publications of formal journals. Uh, but formal journals don't really like stuff like this so much. Um, they like to see things like adjunct professorships, but, you know, again, like, you're not really going to become an adjunct professor doing stuff like this. Uh, they also like to see me doing more project work, and uh, project work is very clearly defined with, with clear goals and clear outcomes, and this isn't. This is more like trying something and seeing what will happen, trying something and seeing what patterns emerge. It's, you know, it's, it's a connectivist research program as, as well as connectivist education. And so that does create some ripples. But, you know, I think in the end, I, I decided somewhere around year three of my PhD, after reading a, a book from Robert Nozak on philosophical explanations, that I was going to stop arguing. I, I was going to stop trying to convince people that I'm right. And the reason for that is, well, first, first and foremost, and most importantly, I never succeeded. Uh, and I realized, after a certain time, I could be the best arguer in the world. But if I started out with somebody disagreeing with me, the probabilities were almost zero that they would change their mind. Because people defend their beliefs defend their way of life, defend their background and experience in the face of almost all manner of contrary evidence and reason. So you can't argue people into a belief. You can't argue people into a perspective or a point of view. And so what I decided at that point was, and, and this has become part of the core of my own approach to education as well, was to, to live the theory. Um, so I do my work openly, for example. Um, you know, we, George and I, we didn't just conduct this course openly. We planned it openly. We, we went online with Dave Cormier and talked about what we were thinking of doing and how we would structure the course and what technology we might use. Uh, we had the wiki open so people could help us. You know, um, I do my research openly. Uh, and and in a connectivist sort of way, and, and I try to join networks rather than form little project groups. And the best evidence for the work that I'm doing is my own career and my own work. If people think that uh, what I say has value, then that is evidence for what I say. Um, if people think that the work that I've done has value, or even if people look at my career and say, yeah, that was a successful way to have a career, um, as opposed to, you know, trying to become a tenure track professor or whatever, um, then that is evidence for the age. So I try to offer a model rather than try to argue. And I, I find I'm happier, I'm a lot happier that way because I don't find myself living contradictions and the people around me have, have I think, learned that uh, this is what I'm up to and have given me the space to do that, and that really helps. Uh, what we try to do this year with our educational bar camp is to put together a list of the, like propositions or political statements that we can hand over to uh, the people who are you know, responsible for developing the educational system. Mm -hmm. So if you have anything you would put on that list, you are more than welcome to, to send us an email or just tell us now what, what you would put on the list. Well, um, the primary objective of education is individual empowerment. It's not employment. It's not to pass culture along. It's to make or to enable people to define their own path and to pursue their own good in their own way, whatever that may be, to the, be to the best of their abilities. That's my manifesto. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, uh, everyone.